What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pat Daily, brought to you by our good friends at Prize Fix, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media. Today, I got two juggernauts from Pro Football Network, NFL Draft Analyst Ian Cummings, Patriots and NFL Analyst Dak Randall. We are here to do a mock draft because tis the season, boys. The draft is coming up. We got to do as many permutations as humanly possible so we can say, hey, I walked into the Pats. So I was right on board with that. I was already ahead of schedule. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Before we get into exactly how this is going to go, so we're going to use the Pro Football Network draft machine. I want you guys to explain exactly how this thing works. You guys have a lot of really cool features I've never actually seen from one of these systems. So before we get into that, Ethan, how are you guys doing? First, Dak, then Ian, going out better order. <laughs> uh, I'm doing good, man. I, I'm, I'm fighting off vacation brain a little bit because I uh, I'm I'm going to Italy tomorrow for ten days. Ooh, um, so I'm just you know like trying to fight through that and uh, and get through a couple more days of work. But I'm doing good. Um, you know, it's we had that brief little come down from free agency, which is really busy, but we're going right into NFL draft. So there's obviously plenty of, to talk about. And uh, the Patriots are the number three pick. You know, remain in the news a lot. So. Um, it's been good, and uh, you know that they, they, they're an interesting team to cover still at this point, um, and a fun team to uh, to mock trap for, as we'll get to in a bit. Yeah, I'm fighting vacation brain as well, not in the same sense. I'm more more so dreaming of the vacation that's going to come early May once the draft is over. You know, we got a long stretch before then, but it's been fun for sure. It's been a grind, you know, since the Senior Bowl and the Combine and all those things. But each event is kind of a different piece of the puzzle of getting that complete picture. And you mentioned it with your mock drafts. You you got me pegged, man. I I, I try to mock one different player every time, right? So you cover all your bases so you can say that you mocked him, right? No, that's not it. But you are right. There's so many different permutations with the mock drafts and the PFN MD. Yes, it's such a great tool for doing that, you know, just kind of going through each possible outcome. And it gets a little redundant down the stretch. At this point, you're like, let's just see what happens, right? But we still got a little more time to explore. And that's the that's the beauty of it. Yep. I actually just dropped another mock today. It was my third one. I'm trying every time to get somebody different, try trades, try no trades, just to see how things can work out. So that's the whole point of these things. And also, I hear you guys with a vacation brain. I'm like in between where I yeah. people who watch will know this is not my usual setup. I am actually in my parents' office. I had to take away some pictures of myself as a baby from the background because I don't want anybody using those against me. But, uh, yeah, we're in uh, different stages, I guess. So now, guys, please break down what you guys have got going over with this mock draft simulator because, again, really impressive stuff. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll let you take this one, Ian. You've obviously been in the company longer and I think maybe more heavily involved in the, in the mock draft stuff. I mean, hey, you you did the multi-user mock with us, though, right? You were the – what team were you again? You were the Patriots, right? Yeah, I was. I was yeah, you, he was wheeling and dealing, man. He was trading, yeah. hopping down. I was like, man, I, I like some of the offers I'm getting here. But, yeah, no, that was a lot of fun. Um, It's primarily been single user for a long time, and that's been, the I think, the, the most – it's immersive in a different way. It allows you to really think through the options. You have more time to kind of compose your thoughts. But the multi-user update has been so uh, exciting to me because you can kind of play the role of GM with your friends in real time, too. And so you can trade with them if you want to. I think right now it's upwards of 10 users can draft at the exact same time and go through that process. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and we've got prospect breakdowns in there. I take info from my personal reports and put them in. We have almost the entire top 100 filled out with that. But as I work down the board, we're going to keep going through with that but the baseline is it's just a tool for exploring different outcomes like we said earlier right that's kind of what you want it to be that's what an mds should be because we don't know what's going to happen right so which players might be available at your pick who can you choose from and who gives you the best value from round one to round seven it's a really nice exploratory tool for that and um it allows you to be flexible which i think is the whole point of the draft process so just a really cool immersive tool to use yeah and i i think the, the thing i like the most about it um you know it's just you can get what up to nine or ten uh, 10 people in it at once um yeah. and you know you each person takes a team and you kind of have fun with it it's almost like a fantasy draft in that sense where you know you can either kind of play it shock or you can lean heavy into trades which is what i typically try to do uh and also kind of like fantasy drafts like ian said you know you can click on all the prospects and, and see uh his reports as well as other reports from other people in our scouting department uh, and that's really helpful especially for me like if i'm in the later rounds and i'm like you know i, I want the patriots to have sort of a tall corner who profiles as a boundary corner to some of these guys fit that bill you know i can click on on the uh, profiles and, and and read what ian and the other guys have to say uh so if you're into mock drafting and simulating with your friends and everything uh you know i think this is the best spot to do it for sure yeah seriously especially the player descriptions and everything those are extremely helpful especially once you get into the later rounds because 
honestly, like I'm mostly watching quarterbacks, receivers, and tackles, and then kind of tight ends are mixed in there. So if you see any of my mocks, I usually like double dip the tight end. Spoiler, mm-hmm. I did it again because those are the guys I know, you know. But uh, yeah, again, you guys with the tools in the player descriptions are very, very helpful. But Dak, you and I are Patriots guys. We're going to stick to what we know. So this, we each did our own versions of a Patriots mock draft. And Ian, you are going to be the judge. We're each going to say who we picked at these different slots. And for that, just to make things a little easier, we did avoid trades. Uh, but yeah, Ian, you're going to decide who had the best pick. And then at the end, I got my handy dandy notepad here. We're going to go over and see how the draft turned out. Are we ready? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I might, there might have been a, a communication breakdown. Did you say you, you did you say you avoided trades? Yes. So there may have been a communication breakdown. See, <laughs> this is what vacation brain does to me. Okay, that's fine. We can still roll with it because we're professionals. Yeah, no, I I, I did three trades and wound up making 10 picks, including three in the fourth round. So we'll be, we'll have a little bit of variance here, but I picked someone in each round. So we'll Yeah, I was gonna say I remember Dax Mock having the three the trade symbol on like four picks. I was like, oh shoot, wait well, a actually, minute. Actually, no, you are absolutely right. Yeah, no, that's again, it's the vacation brain, but we're gonna roll with it. <laughs> I'm gonna get buried here because I think Dakota, you're gonna have much better value, but we're still gonna have fun with this. All right, so do you – you're obviously the guest. So would you like to go first with who you picked first on your board? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll go first. And, you know, I've done three mock drafts for PFN now. And, you know, I know there are a lot of these reports out there uh, that the Washington Commanders are, are leaning towards taking Jane and Daniels at number two. Maybe there's truth to that. Maybe there's not. you got to take all the pre-draft uh, reporting with a, train, with a grain of salt, I think. Uh, but every time I run one of these, Jane and Daniels is the guy who's available at number three. Uh, and I am of the belief that, you know, I just think the Patriots, um, regardless of, you know, what other needs they have or, or, or what kind of value they could get by trading down. I just think you, you can't bank on being this high in the draft again, um, especially, you know, with in the same year as a good quarterback class. So uh, I'm going quarterback no matter what, no matter who's there. And in this case, it's Jaden Daniels. Um, but I know and I'm curious to see what, later on what Ian has to say, because I know uh, you maybe have a, a, a different take on Drake May than some of the other people that that we've been seeing in the industry right now, as far as how he compares to Jamie Daniels. Yeah, well, you're going to have a runway because I lucked out and got Drake May. He's my guy. So I had to go with him. I, I like Jamie Daniels. I wanted to. I wanted Drake May too. But Okay, so at least like our hearts are in the same place. Because, I mean, I, I like Jamie Daniels, and I cannot make that clear enough. I feel like if you, you know, advocate for one guy, it's just almost implied with some people that you don't like the other. It's not mm-hmm. true. I just like with Drake May, the upside, the age – it's also very important to note that I am not the one who's picking. My job is not on the line. So it's a lot easier for me to sit here and be like, go with the guy who has all the upside. Uh, but like looking at his game, I feel like he gets a lot of comparisons to like Zach Wilson because of some of the inaccuracy at times. And you see him just make these like wild kind of like out of structure. He'll throw it the last minute when he's getting hit. And I get that a bit. But when I watch Drake, I feel like that part of his game is more controlled. Like he doesn't look panicky, I don't think, when he's under pressure. Like sometimes, yeah, his mechanics will break down. But at 21, in my opinion, I'm saying that I trust my coaching staff to fix that, especially with a guy like Alex Van Pelt, who can actually work on footwork throughout the season, whereas most offensive coordinators aren't really doing that. It's more this is who we're playing. These are the guys you want to attack. It's more scheme related, not so much about fundamentals. So, yeah, with Drake, I feel like the Patriots, although they do need to build up their supporting cast, are one of the better systems in terms of the in terms of the kind of coaching that he's going to get. But, uh, Ian, I'm very curious to hear your take on Drake. Yeah, and there's a caveat here. I think, you know, it really depends on what the commanders do, which is what Dakota said as well. You know, it depends. Are they going to take Jaden Daniels or Drake May? Whoever gets picked, you know, the, the other one is the one who's left, right? So you're kind of stuck with him. I will say, you know, if May is the pick at two, I would pick Jaden at three. Jaden is my QB three over JJ McCarthy right now. I know McCarthy's been rising a lot, and I'm going to revisit that one more time. But there's a certain point where you have to give credit. And Taylor, you have made a great point. Like, there's kind of a notion so far this cycle where if you like one guy, people act like you got to hate the other one. No, that's not the case at all. Like, I like Jaden Daniels. I really like Drake May, right? It's just one of those things. It's a tiered system, and you need to kind of fit them on that tier. I would prefer Drake May. So if he's there at number three, that's the dream scenario for me. I won't pretend to be a schematic expert. I'm still learning that part of the game. But Alex Van Pelt's scheme, looking at what he was able to do with Joe Flacco down the stretch in Cleveland last year, I think a lot of those concepts will fit with May's profile. Is that strong-armed passer with that drive velocity to take advantage of those seam balls, those out routes, those corners. I really like that part of his game. And I think going to your point, you know, his adaptability off script, 
he can be a little uncontrolled at times, but I still think the leverage IQ as a pocket navigator and as a field processor, right? You know, identifying those mismatches, very high level for just a 21 year old. So I think the things that he needs to correct are correctable. And you have a very good athlete who's an off script creator at 6'4, 225, right? With that wicked arm, that arm elasticity. Uh, I think he checks every single box for me. And he's got that high end processing ability to, to mold around too. So I like Jaden Daniels a lot too. I think if he's the last one there at three, his big play ability is a runner and a creator that's very much worth investing in but may is the dream scenario for you if you're new england so i think that's who we're all kind of we all want it to be may ideally so i think we can agree that's probably the consensus pick is that fair if he's there obviously we're going with the board all right fantastic all right now round two actually real uh, real quick i want to ask one quick question of you guys i'm just curious what either one of you made of drake may's pro day performance because and again it's not real football It's, it's it's scripted and everything we know the caveats of the pro day but at least you know, for me, it felt like it was maybe a, an accurate microcosm of him as a prospect where you saw some of the flaws early on, some of the errant throws. But as it went on, you, he really got to showcase the arm talent and some of the, the the high level throws that he can make. But what did you guys make of his pro day performance? Yeah, I don't I don't put a ton of stock in the pro days just because I think, you know, those throwing situations that we see in game with pressure and with coverage. I think that's a lot more indicative of what he can do. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think pro days are good for measuring mechanics, throwing ability off platform, right? How comfortable they are with those corrective mechanics and that fail safe. And I think we did see a little bit of, of everything, you know, with him. I think there was that one corner route early on that he airman a little bit there are times where his mechanics will get a little tall and he'll push it high but down the stretch a lot of really nice deep throws i like that he was throwing with touch as well because that's something that he can improve on tape um but he was able to do that as well and then off platform keeping his base and his shoulders level and then using that rotation and working through that and not forcing it or anything i think if he can continue to do that and mature in that part of his game that can unlock a lot of what we want to see from him and that we have seen in spurts that georgia tech game for example was an immaculate you saw more control with those mechanics you know channeling that talent so if he can show that and i think down the stretch in his pro day it was good because most of his bad throws were early on and then he really settled in and showed us what he could do and you mentioned it earlier, Ian, like we're all trying to learn different things. Like you mentioned, like schematics for you, still working progress for me. QB mechanics are not my area of expertise. Like I try to inhale as much as I can when I see something from, you know, like Derek Klassen or somebody like that who really knows their stuff. But for me, pro days are more kind of about like body language, how you respond to the adversity, how your teammates are around, you, you know, kind of because those are the things where we listen to Elliot Wolf and Gerard Mayo. They talk about those in intang- and Alex Van Pelt. They talk about the intangible so much. And it seemed like, one, I loved it when he would miss a throw, he would go back and try it again. Because if you're talking about a guy who's going to have to rework his mechanics and you're really going to have to make some strides in the way that he is able to execute on the field, you want somebody who's not going to settle for, all right, I missed, let's move on. Somebody who says, no, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it again and I'm going to do it better. I love to see that. You know, I don't want to talk too much into like how, you know, you respond to teammates. I think they're all at least trained to the point where it's like, yeah, don't make this guy look like a jerk. Like, but mm-hmm. at the same time, it did seem like he had a really good energy with his teammates and they responded to him well. Also a two-time captain. So it's not like it's exactly surprising. But, you know, in terms of the things where, yes, pro day is, if you're Drake May, the pro day is for you. Like Jaden Daniels, not so much because he doesn't have a great arm. So if he tries to like, you know, the Zach Wilson, sometimes it's not going to look as good as a guy like Drake. You just flick it and it goes like 60 yards on a dot. Uh, but yeah, I, I liked what I saw from him in terms of trying to make sure that he was improving on the fly. And then it seemed like he had a good relationship with his teammates. And that's the kind of stuff that I feel like the coaches are really looking at in terms of those relationships and stuff like that. Cool. Awesome. All right. Now on to round two. What you got, Dad? Yeah, so uh, when Ian, when Ian, myself, and a lot of the other guys at PFN did our sort of uh, our multi-user mock draft simulation last week, where we all sort of part- partook in it, um, I was aggressively trying to trade back up into the first round and get a receiver. Uh, I was probably going a little overboard with the trade offers, and I, I was trying to do the same thing in this one. Um, and then I eventually kind of took the foot off the gas and waited, uh, and Xavier Worthy fell to me at number 34. Um, I, and again, just like I was with quarterback in the first round, I'm of the mindset that, like, you know, one way or another, the Patriots got to take a receiver. Um, mm-hmm. Either be either be with that second round pick or trading back into the first round. You could absolutely make the case for the tackle, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree. But for me, it's like they they've needed this. Uh, they've needed a, a top receiving talent uh, prospect for for far too long. And for me, I think Xavier Worthy checks a lot of the boxes. Um, he's got all the speed that you're looking for. And for me, it's really just best receiver available at that spot. And in my opinion, that was Xavier Worthy. I had him there too. 
I had a hard time, though. He's so explosive and so talented. It's not like he's not a good player. I just feel like the Patriots need one of those big body guys because we know with the Packers, the way they draft, it's not super common for them. They get guys who are like under 5'11", and they already have that DeMario Douglas. So I'm talk- as much as I would like to fit somebody like that in, I'm thinking, how are they really going to scheme that? Where are these guys going to fit? They don't have a lot of really big body receivers. So I did wait on receiver in this round, mostly because Kingsley Suomateo was there. I really, really like him. It was tough because realistically, I'd like them to get a guy who can make an impact in year one with that second pick, but he's a really talented player. I feel like once you start to get later on in the draft, they're more developmental guys, but they're just things that I'm kind of more worried about. Like Patrick Paul is someone who doesn't really fit. He's bigger than what uh, Elliot Wolf usually goes for a tackle, but I feel like athletically he kind of makes up for that a bit, but still there are some parts of his game. Like he uses that like hug technique where he lets guys into his chest and it feels like he it will work sometimes, but against NFL, like real power, I feel like that's going to be an issue for him. And also just NFL speed, I'm wondering how he's going to deal with that on a consistent basis. And Kingsley, like young guy, was a captain at BYU with 20, he was probably 20 uh, during the season or turned 21, one or the other. I mean, just such a talented guy. And I feel like if you get a guy like Drake, you want, like, even if it's Jacoby Brissett, who's the one playing and taking the hits, uh, I think Chooks is still fine in terms of a, a pass protector, but I'm just a really big Kingsley guy. So I went with him and with the history of the Browns and the Packers kind of finding that value for receivers in more like third round, fourth round, fifth round. I was like, all right, let me try to go in a direction similar to that and see if I can find value. So Kingsley was my guy. But Ian, what do you think? Damn. This is tough because whoever I pick here kind of dictates who I take later on too. So I'm trying oh, to, th- I'm trying, I'm trying to think about that too. But I, I like both guys, and I think there's a, a similar argument to make. Both the very young players who it really clicked for them pretty early on, right? Kingsley is still kind of improving on the technical side, but you know, once he transferred to BYU, starter on the right side, then I moved over to the left side, right? He's got that left-right versatility already, so you'd love to see that. Very explosive, very powerful competitor. Really good in the run game with that driving power from his lower body but there are really nice flashes of hand usage and pass protection too i think the weight leveraging the weight distribution on his transfers can be a little more consistent the balance can be a little more consistent but like you said you're working with a lot of talent there and then xavier worthy stepped onto the campus as a true freshman in texas and he was the man right you know he was immediately producing at a high level um he's unique because he's you know you mentioned it taylor the Packers and the Browns, right? The profile of, of receiver, both in the draft range and the physical profile, kind of fits a Javon Baker in the middle rounds. Like, kind of a bigger guy who's a really good route runner, who's got really strong hands, who you know you can insert right away. But I look at Xavier Worthy, man, and I'm just really high on it. I'm worthy. You know, like he's going to be a top 30 guy for me, probably. I Very explosive generational speed that goes without saying, but he knows how to use it as a route runner. And that's what wins me over, man. He's got the tempo, the tempo modulations, the throttle control, the sinking ability and, and the bend on stems too. He can press up field. And when he presses up field, that's a nightmare for DBs, man, because he can get by you so easily. So they're, they're, they're fleeing upfield, and then he can cut that stem, divert outside, cut really tight angles on those route breaks. I think he's got really good ball, ball tracking ability in the deep third, too, and contortion. His hands, there were some focus drops, but he improved on that in 2023. I think, in general, the focus drops are more of a focus issue than a hand technique issue, which gives me a little bit of solace. I think as long as you get more repetition, you can work on that. He's got wiry play strength for his size. I do think there's a lot to like with him. So... I'm going to go with Xavier Worthy because he's the higher rated player on my board. And also another thing, too, I think the gravitational effect that he has on the rest of the receiving core is really, really underrated, too, because you look at what his speed can do, really stretching defenses thin in the deep third, right? Opening a lot of space for guys underneath to win one on one coverage, right? You know, Xavier Worthy is a threat that's just so menacing at different levels. You have to account for that with multiple guys, and that can leave guys open, too. So I think what he can do one on one and the impact he can have stretching defenses thin is really valuable. And then you look at Drake May and his drive velocity, hitting those deep shots with, with Xavier Worthy. That's a lot of big play potential, man. So I love that. And I think you can scheme him rack touches, too. Just a lot of potential energy with Xavier Worthy, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think. <laughs> I think the big variable in all this too um, is, you know, obviously we're we're conducting these mock drafts now with the with the roster the Patriots currently have in place. But you know, are they really done this off season? I tend to think they're not. Uh, I think they're. I don't know who it's going to be, but I'm fairly confident they're going to go out and, and trade for a receiver somewhere along the line. I don't think it's not going to be easy. They might have to pay a premium, but I just think they're going to do it, or they might go out and trade for for a left tackle, one of the two. Um, and I just it. 
I just personally think they are going to somehow go out and get a wide out. Um, someone who profiles as, as a boundary receiver, as you said, Taylor. So for me, I didn't mind taking a guy like Worthy in that spot. Uh, but again, we, you know, that's that's all sort of projection. Who knows what the Patriots are really going to do? But again, if they go out and trade for a tackle or receiver, that probably significantly alters, you know, the math that they have uh, in the second and the third round. You look at a guy like T. Higgins. It feels like every day that goes by, we know he's going to get traded at some point, and then it just feels like the Bengals are kind of losing leverage every day. Where it's like, all right, you got to do something with him. So I'm not going to give you a haul. It's probably going to be. I feel like it's probably going to be something like a. What would you guys say? Something like a third, and then an additional like day three pick. What are we thinking? The cards aren't really in there. In there, yeah, they don't have a lot of the cards to work with because, as you said, people know he's going to get traded at some point, and the more time that goes on, you lose more leverage. So I think it'll be it would be day two at this point, and uh, I think it, it goes a little bit lower with every passing day. But at the same time, there is going to be demand for him. There's always going to be demand because he's a very good receiver. So it's just a matter of when they reach that breaking point. I think day two is a good bet, though. Yeah, yeah and I guess similar. Uh, with with Brandon Ayuk too, I, I just don't know if he's ultimately going to get traded. This feels like one where any at any point we're just going to get word of the extension um, after talking about this trade for so long. But I don't know. Like, what do you guys think? Do you think Brandon Ayuk is more or less likely to get traded than T. Higgins? I don't think trading Ayuk makes any sense personally. I, I would want for it to happen, you know, as someone who covers the Patriots. But he's one of the best receivers in the NFL. Not even he's the best receiver on his team, best pass catcher on his team, and I think he's top 10 you could argue like top six type receivers so i don't think it makes i think deep trading Debo makes way more sense because somebody really needs that kind of playmaker you know he gets dinged up he's still a fantastic player but we saw in the super bowl like he's i i say he's a great football player i wouldn't say he's a great receiver because there are things in this game where it's like technically not the most advanced guy but it's like he also makes plays and that's completely undeniable so i agree i don't think it makes any sense to get rid of you yeah and like I, I don't know the contract details as you know, I'm not an expert on it with Debo, but like just uh, per, purely on the service level, what they provide, like I, I'd rather trade him and keep Brandon because Brandon's just so multifaceted as a weapon. 100%. All right. So if Xavier Worthy is the pick, again, I'm not mad at it. One of the most fun things to scout is a receiver who's fast and knows how to use that speed. Yeah. And he puts the fear of God into defensive backs. And also the contact balance was not expecting that. How often mm -hmm. like guys, you know, when he's fast, I don't want to say it's a half-hearted tackle. Sometimes you really just misjudge the angle. And if guys are just kind of throwing arms at him, he can run through it. That's what, like less, than 107, less than 180 pounds. So that was really impressive. I do like to pick. I'm kind of jealous I didn't do it now. But that's okay. We're moving <laughs> on. All right, next. This is where things started to get interesting, Dad. Who'd you uh, pick next? What was your move? Yeah, so at this spot, uh, I made a trade with the Rams. They offered me pick number 83 and pick number 99 for my 68th pick and a fifth rounder next year's draft. Uh, so I made that deal. And so all the way down at 83, I took Washington tackle Roger Rosengarten. Now I also took him in the, the, the multi-user draft that Ian and I did last week. Um, and so I'm not going to sit here and, and act like I've, I've watched a ton of Roger Rosengarten tape, but I, I, I made the pick with, uh, in, uh, in mind with something that Ian said last week, which was that even though Rosengarten profiles currently more as a right tackle prospect, he has the traits you're looking for to potentially develop into a left tackle. And, you know, on top of that, this isn't a, a popular opinion, but I actually think the Patriots are okay at left tackle. Like, I don't love it, but I actually think, you know, if they had to play a game today, I actually think they'd be all right. I think, you know, I still can't pronounce his name. Chuck Chukuma, uh, Chukuma Okorafor. Yeah, yeah, or Chuck uh, uh, Okorafor. Um, you know, I know the Patriots believe he can play left tackle, um, and other people have, have reported that as well. And I actually think, yeah, I thought Vidarian Lowe, he ha was really had, had high highs last year, probably lower lows, but I thought down the stretch he actually played well on the left side. I don't think he's a franchise left tackle. He's probably at his peak maybe more of a swing tackle, but I just think in a pinch – Either one of those guys might be passable on the left side uh, to give a developmental left tackle prospect more time uh, to develop if they're not ready to start. And so for me, it feels like Rosengarden checks those uh, kind of boxes. Um, but I'll be curious to hear your thoughts again on him, Ian, because um, you, your insight was kind of why I went with him in, uh, as the pick in both drafts. Honestly, I'm with you at the left tackle spot. I feel like because people don't really know Chooks, they just assume that he's a bad player. And obviously, like, oh, he got benched by the Steelers, what happened? I mean, if you look at him in pass protection, like he went up against uh, Nick Bosa. Nick Bosa, I, I keep getting them mixed up in my head. But he went up against Bosa and like actually had a really good game. Now, 
as a run blocker, I know he's kind of inconsistent, but there's also some nastiness to his game where he finishes. He's got some pancakes on his tape. Wasn't impressed necessarily by the run blocking, but I think it's good enough for a left tackle. And again, the pass protection is the most important thing at the end of the day. When you look at like Jonah Williams, who was a guy that a lot of Patriots fans wanted, if you look at the numbers, he's better. And if you look like athletically, I think Chooks is better, maybe just not as technically sound as someone like a Jonah Williams. So I just wanted to say, I, I do agree there. And Darian Lowe, definitely better on the left side. I went with Javon Baker. This is where I was like, all right, address the top three needs in the top three uh, positions. Baker, we talked about this before the show, Ian. At first, I was hearing like, oh, his hands are like crazy. And, you know, the hype was through the roof. So I watched him. Notice there were times where, like you talked about with Xavier Worthy, it's more focus drops. With Baker, it seemed more like the way he's actually catching the ball, where sometimes his hands are coming together rather than you just like actually flash the triangle and, you know, just make it easier on yourself. There's some issues with making catches through contact or when he's kind of diving and falling, the ball kind of pops out. And I'm like, all right, that kind of skewed my view a little bit. But then I'm like, I follow a lot of people who have been really putting out some good Javon Baker content and the route running is really high level, especially for a guy who's probably going to go in like the third, fourth round kind of range. And then, I mean, as inconsistent as I think his hands are, he also has some crazy moments where it's like, not that his hands are bad. I think he just needs to get coached up so he can be more consistent. But the high-end talent that he's got, if you're talking about the third round, that's a guy I'm willing to bank on. He's got dynamic playmaking ability over the top and underneath. I think, again, that route running can make him a true three-level threat. And with a guy like Alex Van Pelt, who likes to move people all over the formation, with Baker's size, he can play outside, he can play in the slot, you can line him up in the backfield if you want to. I like the versatility that he offers. So, yeah, I had to go with the tackle in the second round. So third, I was like, I got to get a receiver, and Baker was my favorite guy that was on the board. Yeah, and Baker, to your point, like his route running is really impressive. I think he's really twitched up for his size, and he's like 6'1", over 200 too. So that's a rocked up dude, and he can move with a ton of energy. He's got a great release package. He's got great stem work and spatial IQ. His blind spot awareness too, like he knows how to manipulate DBs with that high energy motion. He's not just uncontrolled out there. So that's what you love to see. And then at the same time too, I think, you know, you mentioned that the highs are very high at the catch point. Like we're talking about some of the most insane catches in the class where he's back shoulder contorting, you know, stretching a crazy angles and getting the ball past his frame where only he can get it. Um, but then at the same time, against contact is where the inconsistency lies. And that's kind of where my biggest concern for Baker is, is that I don't think the vertical speed is going to translate super well against NFL athletes. And then I think because of that, he might have to rely on that contested catch ability a little more often. And will he be able to convert, right? That's the big question with him. So I think a really good utility weapon, again, with slot boundary versatility, really good route runner. You can scheme him open a little bit. You can move him across the front. He's a really good blocker too. And that, by the way, Taylor, because Dakota sent me your entire board, your entire draft. And that was the first thought that went in my mind, like all these guys can block, man. Every single one of them, right? So Javon Baker can do that too. So that's another thing that gets overlooked look sometimes for wide receivers but it's important as well so i want to i want to preface with this because sua Mataya and baker like because i'm gonna pick rosengarten here just because we picked a wide receiver and i want to i want to i want to check my box as well i feel bad because i'm going with both of them but um i do see the merit with baker and sua Mataya and sua Mataya in particular and then round two because there's a little bit of a drop off in the tackle class so you get that upside right there at that precipice that can really help you out but roger rosengarten is a little bit higher on my board. He's a top 64 guy for me. I'm a really big fan of the upside that's present with him. He needs to improve his play strength, but his athleticism and not just the, the testing numbers, right? The functional athleticism, the recovery athleticism is really impressive with him. The lateral burst to regain positioning, really high energy motion, really smooth hinge flexibility too. You know, he's very good at flipping his hips to the apex, really smooth, malleable blocker who's got active hands as well. Very physical. He's not the longest guy, but he has enough length to work with. And then I think that natural leveraging that knee bend that weight those really smooth weight transfers as well great range as a run blocker I, I and i do think you know he's a natural right tackle but things that i look for when you're moving to the left tackle athleticism coordination balance i think he has all of those things so i think you could experiment with this so i'm gonna go with rosengarten suan mataya and baker in my opinion would be a win in rounds two and three but i think Worthy gives you that gravitational effect and that speed threat. He can be a three-level weapon on his own. And then Rosengarten has really high-level tools to mold. Do you think Rosengarten can play in year one? Because it's just, like you said, the functional strength and just he needs to add more weight. I feel like he's going to get abused at the next level before he puts that on. Do you disagree? 
I think he'll take his lumps. Do I think you need to keep him off the field entirely? Not necessarily, because he is a pretty nuanced pass protector. He's got really good footwork. I think he gets really good depth on his kick, really good matching technique. He doesn't get too uncontrolled with his depth. And then he's got really good depend too. you know we've seen at the senior bowl in particular in one-on-ones where he was combating extensions using that independent hand usage to gather and la- latch onto rushers so i do think he has that element i just think he needs to fill it out with his frame a little more i think that's the biggest thing because against power against powerful guys who know how to channel that power with their hand strikes he might be a little less consistent against those guys so i think he'll take his lumps but i do think he has that that you know re- recovery athleticism gives him that corrective fail safe that will enable him to withstand adversity a little better yeah and i think the other huge variable in all this too is the coaching that he, that he or any prospect or offensive tackle prospect they get because that's been as much as much as people want to talk about the offensive line talent for the patriots the last few years i really think as much as anything it was the shortcomings that they had as a coaching staff, especially on on the offensive line. I mean, we know about the disaster of 2022 when Matt Patricia was the offensive line coach for a little while. um, And then he basically just became full-time play calling. It was Billy Yates who was like the de facto uh, head offensive line coach. And then last year was Adrian Clem, um, who midway through the season uh, left for the rest of the year because of a medical issue. But before that, I think it was fair to question what level of coaching uh, those players were getting. And I mean, the entire operation just didn't seem to be on the same page. So it's hard. You don't want to pin it all on Adrian Clem. Um, but it just as a whole, the offensive line wasn't getting the coaching that it needed last season. And so the hope, if you're the Patriots, and, and something that especially could, you know, make them a little bit better this year than people think is, you know, a noticeable improvement, both in terms of offensive line talent, but also the coaching they get. So is Scott Peters that guy? You know, I don't, none of us know, right? Um, but you know, I, if you're a Patriots fan, that's what you're hoping for is that, you know, the combination of the the other coaches that they've added on offense and then if Scott Peters proves to be a good hire, that maybe it brings a developmental prospect like Rosengarten along faster than he would otherwise. Yeah, I'm a big Scott Peters guy too. Like we don't know how he's going to be with his own room, but he does. Like we've seen obviously working with Bill Callahan, like that's a pretty good notch to have on your belt. So he's got a lot of experience with one of the best offensive line coaches in history kind of like uh, when Scar left, but there were still guys on the staff who understood how he taught things, and there was a little bit more that could translate. And Peters, like, has his own business where he teaches technique. He's really big on that where, you know, when he played the position, so he understands what it's like from those guys' perspective. Clem did as well, but, you know, it's, I think it's fair to say that Scott Peters in his position has had more success at the NFL level than in Adrian Clem. So yeah. I think that's a really good point. The coaching is going to be a big factor in this. All right, we got some more picks to go. First, got to send it over to our friends at Prize Picks. Be right back. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Prize picks. All right, Dak, who do you have next on your board? I, I like this pick. I like this one a lot. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to go through my whole entire round four all at once? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why not? Yeah. So um, I, I crushed it in this round. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> at, at 103, uh, I took Kate Stover, the tight end uh, out of Ohio State. I just think that's another huge need for the Patriots. Yeah, this season, I think that they'll be all right with Hunter Henry and Austin Hooper. Those are two good tight ends. But they've just neglected the tight end position for so long. Bill Belichick not drafting any talent, leaving the cover dry uh, this offseason. The Patriots obviously brought back uh, Hunter Henry, but I just think they got to get uh, uh, some young talent there. Um, and, you know, they can't wait any longer. And then after that, so I got that 99th pick from the Rams uh, in the earlier trade. And so I took that pick along with a 2025 seventh rounder next year, flipped it to the Bills to get picks 128 and 133. So I was able to make three total picks in round four. 
And with those other two picks, uh, I took Jalen Ford, linebacker out of Texas. I actually think the Patriots, just similar with offensive tackle, like they're they're sneaky good at linebacker, but I think the ceiling is just low. And I think I think Juwan Bentley, for as good and, and solid of a player as he is and and the leadership that he brings, I thought he, he you know, you could see the, the tread on the tires at the end of last season. He's played a lot of snaps over the last few years. I just think they have to start planning for the future of that, of that position. And Jelani Tavai, too, good player, but – Again, there's a ceiling there. I'm actually pretty high on, on Sion uh, Taki Taki, the, the, the mm-hmm. linebacker they signed in free agency. I think he could be um, a, a really good fit for them, especially in coverage. But regardless, I think they need to get a young linebacker uh, and address that position as well. And then at 133, I went with Malik Washington, the receiver out of Virginia. Um, and again, this is a guy who I'm, I'm mostly going off of what I've read as a, uh, for the scouting profile. Um, and so, Ian, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on this. It seems like he might be a little redundant with somebody like Demario Douglas, short, really explosive athlete. But for me, I just wanted to, again, go with the best receiver available at this spot. Um, I, I wanted to come out of this draft with at least two receivers for the Patriots. Um, and even if there's a little positional redundancy, I'm all right if, you know, the Patriots are adding more speed and explosiveness on offense. And in this draft, for me anyway, they certainly are doing that with Malik Washington and Xavier Worthy. Yeah, going with the Mighty Mites. I don't hate it. I don't, they're small. My team's small, but, you know. <laughs> they are feisty yeah. and they are fast. So there's something exactly. to say that. Um, so my pick was DJ James, cornerback out of Auburn. This is another guy. I haven't gotten to watch a ton of the quarterbacks, so I'm going off scouting reports. But I wanted a guy who was really good in press coverage, a guy who's got some versatility. And also, I know with him, size is a bit of concern. Uh, but that's something, like, obviously, that can be corrected. But. One thing he has, I feel like some of the other guys in this range don't have is the top end speed to actually be able to hang with guys. Now, one thing that really does concern me, I feel like cornerback is one of the sneakiest area of needs for this team. I say sneaky because they have a lot of bodies there. You have Christian Gonzalez, Jonathan Jones, Marcus Jones. Fair to think they're probably going to be the starters. And Alex Austin could emerge. We don't know. He looked really good late last year. Isaiah Bolden, maybe. (laughs) Isaiah Bolden, you know. Isaiah Bolden, another guy. Getting kind of getting excited about might need some more time because you saw in the preseason it's like he needs some development, but exciting prospect who's also got crazy versatility. Like he played all over the secondary uh when he was in college, and then even like a Marco Wilson had a good game in the last uh matchup against the Jets. So they have a lot of bodies there, but most of those guys are either inexperienced and unproven, or they're or actually a lot of them are both they're inexperienced and unproven, and or they have a significant injury history, whether that is they came off of a season-ending injury or like a Jonathan Jones where he was dealing with lower body injuries throughout the season and then had to get surgery. So I feel like they do need to address cornerback pretty early on. I like Chris um, Abrams drain. That's like one of my pinkies in the fourth round. I really like his skill set. Reminds me of Jack Jones on the field. I feel like every time I bring him up, people are just like, Oh my God, like what? It's like, no, 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 no profile purely on the field. Um, but yeah, but DJ James, I feel like is a guy who, again, from what I read, has not the same level of ball skills, but he can make plays on the ball. I feel like that was something this defense was really lacking last season was guys who could make those kinds of plays. So I feel like I'm going to get creamed again here. But Ian, who won? Just tell me. Tell me I lost. No, well, okay. First off, we got to figure out, are we picking two guys? Because Dakota traded back and got three picks in this round. So are we going to compromise and pick two something of them? has to be said for value. Something's got to be said for value. So I feel I can go whatever you think is best. You're the judge here. I'm going to pick two. I'm going to pick two out of this selection, and I am going to pick DJ James. I like James a lot. I think, yeah, he's like, yeah, let's go. I know, man. I think, um, yeah, I'm a really good man coverage corner who can play press or off. And I think the really nice thing with him is that, you know, yeah, he's got a lighter frame, but he doesn't get out-muscled in press a lot because he'll use his feet first very often. He's not a guy who's going to lurch into contact prematurely. He's got that vertical speed to limit separation up top. I think he's got really good coverage variability, too. Like, he has shown that he can pedal and zone and off, man. He can kick slide a little bit. I think he's got good swivel flexibility and freedom over top comeback routes and hitches where he's not – he's not he doesn't need too many gather steps to transition and close. So I really like that part of his game, too. And then he's a playmaker at the catch point, too. If I'm the Patriots in this range, too, you know, since you do have uncertainty aside from Christian Gonzalez – I would maybe also try and target a guy with some slot boundary versatility. Andrew Phillips from Kentucky is another one that I like a lot within that mold. But DJ James gives you vertical speed, competitiveness. He plays beyond his size and support, too. He's really good coming downhill. He's really feisty, energetic as a competitor. I like that part of his game, too. So I'm going with DJ James. And then hmm, I think it's tough because I got Malik Washington, I got Jalen Ford, and I got Cade Stover to choose from. And I think I'm going to I'm going to reserve one of my tight end selections for later because Taylor stacked tight ends and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, 
Malik Washington, I do think is a little redundant with Demario Douglas, but I do think Douglas, you can move around a little bit. You can scheme and touches a little bit more. Malik Washington, to me, profiles is more of a pure slot guy, but as a pure slot, I think he can be very, very good. I think especially with Xavier Worthy clearing space over top, you can isolate a lot of one-on-one matchups with him, and he's got the twitch, the burst, the route running chops to separate plays beyond his frame at the catch point really fearless player with some really good rack chops too because he's a burly dude he's 5'8 but he's around 190 so he's really compact for his size so i think i'm gonna go with malik washington the mighty mites we're gonna get that we're gonna get that (laughs) small but feisty energy in there and we're gonna go we're gonna go ham i think um with drake may too you know with that outlet right you know drake may on the 2023 film you see those tez walker deep shots but people forget the year before he had josh downs as that outlet in the short range a really explosive a bit undersized downs wasn't quite as burly was a little more agile i think but i still think malik washington gives you that outlet in the short range that can be very valuable for a young qb this is like the honey i shrunk the doll the honey i shrunk the dolphins receiving core <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, between between Jaden Daniels, Xavier Worthy, Malik Washington, and then someone like Demario Douglas, like I've gone from having maybe the slowest offense in the NFL to the fastest, but all my guys might only play like four games in the entire game. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure on the training staff. We'll see if they can get that grade up. All right. Next, who do you got? I I like this one too. Who all right, yeah, go on, Zach. Yeah, I mean. I probably should have gone corner here because I agree with you, Taylor, that I think uh, corner is a sneaky big need for the Patriots. It's why I wish they would have been more aggressive in free agency, um, but they weren't. Maybe they maybe there's a trade down the road. Who knows? Uh, But for me, I also think running back um, is something that they they need to address. And this is typically at least under Bill Belichick. Right? This is where it's hard to talk about the Patriots because if Belichick were still here, I'd be like they're going to go running back in like round five or something because it's it just would fit the mold. As far with Elliot Wolf in charge, um, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna have to see. But you know, with Ramondre Stevenson, he's entering a contract year. You know, I, I I think the word is that they're they're working on a contract extension there. But regardless, I think the Patriots have to get another young back in there uh, who is uh, possibly this season. Um, you know, can eventually earn a role and, and take some of the load off Stevenson Stevenson's shoulders. I mean, when Bill Belichick was the head coach, he was notoriously afraid of playing young running backs uh, especially those who struggled in blitz pickup maybe that changes under Gerard Mayo maybe there's a bit of a longer leash um, but regardless I wanted to go running back here so I went with Audric is it a steam or a steam I think it's estime estime okay yeah um, now the interesting thing uh, I, I did watch him a little bit this year but also reading um, the scouting reports 511 221 and just some of the descriptions of him it almost seems <laughs> like a Ramondre Stevenson 2.0 um, I don't know if that's an accurate comparison or not. I'll be curious with the, uh, of your thoughts, Ian. Um, but regardless, I just wanted to go uh, with a running back here who I think, um, you know, it could earn a role this season, but also, you know, could be potentially a Ramondre Stevenson replacement um, if if he's not long for New England. Yeah, I agree with all that. I double dipped the receiver with this pick. Again, like I said, Packers and the Browns, especially with Elliott Wolf tended to use those rounds to get their receiver talent, and they usually got multiple players at the position. I went with a guy who already has ties to the Patriots staff. That is Bub Means out of Pittsburgh, was coached by assistant wide receivers coach Tyquan Underwood for two seasons when he was a wide receivers coach at Pitt. This is one where I feel like it makes Javon Baker better because this way you don't have to stick Baker outside necessarily. You can have him in the C. You can maybe put him in like stacks and bunches to make his life a little bit easier. Use him as more of that utility guy, like you mentioned, Ian. Because Bub, I think, could be a legitimate X for these guys. I think he's someone who could contribute early on. Now, the route running definitely needs work. Like, you notice there are times where he doesn't really do the best work in zone to make himself friendly. I feel like while he's got that build-up speed and he does a good job, like, using his size to his advantage, it is inconsistent. And I think that might hurt him at times where we know this is a staff that's going to play their young guys. They don't really have an X. So I feel like if you could rotate rotate Baker and Means based on whatever the matchup is, whoever you like more. I also think Means is a guy who could also be a legitimate three-level threat. Now, I will say vertically, like I said, he's got more build-up speed. Like, he's not a burner. But the bigger thing I like is that he gets off press better than I expected him to. And that's where you kind of get that runway where he also does a good job, like, fighting in the stem to make sure guys aren't getting into his body so he can maintain it. And I like his catch radius a lot. Again, work in progress isn't consistent, but I think he's got the tools where – if Baker and Means, if they get coached up really well, especially again, Underwood knows what he's got to work on and what, you know, he gets into a training camp and mini camp and whatever, he knows exactly what needs to be fixed. So 
that was my pick. I think those guys give you much more juice on the outside than they currently have, considering Kendrick Bourne is the only guy you have who you're really expecting to play outside with any level of consistency. And then Demario Douglas can play Z, mostly a slot guy. Then behind them, I would love for Taekwon Thornton to stay healthy and, you know, be able to improve his route running and maybe prove us all wrong. Uh, but it's just there's so much uh, unknown at that position that I feel like a double dip at wide receiver is almost inevitable. This is a tough choice you guys left me with because I, I, I we've picked two wide receivers already. So the instinct in me is to not go triple threat. But at the same time, I really love the Bub Means and that pit connection too. That's that's digging deep. That's impressive. And I think too, you look at Means' tape, uh, there is a lot to work with there. 6'1", I think 213, over 33 inch arms. All of that upside that you mentioned shows up. I, I do think he's got enough twitch and foot speed to, to beat press. I do think he's got enough vertical speed to threaten and get guys off his stems. And then at the same time, there are pretty nice flashes of throttle control too and de deceleration, acceleration, and kind of controlling spatial relationships with that. And then that catch rate is to extend past his frame, make those tough catches down the field. I think there's a lot of work to be done before he reaches that point, right? So that's where the apprehension comes, especially this early in round five. I guess not early, but you know, you do wonder if you can get value elsewhere. And then estimate, you look at him, didn't run as fast as people wanted at the combine, but I, I don't look at long speed as too concerning for running backs as long as you have the explosion in the short ranges to compensate. And I think estimate does. 5'11", 227. I don't see Ramondre as a comp just because Ramondre, I think, was a more versatile receiving threat coming out. I think Ramondre definitely had that part of his game down pat. I think Estime can make catches past his frame, but doesn't have a really defined route tree. Um, you're probably just limiting him to those quick angle routes, those, uh, those swing routes, right? Maybe occasional screens, but not super variable in that phase. I think he's more of that one, two down power back who's got that volume ability, uh, really good inside the tackles, right, with his his vision, his ability to tempo his footwork. I'm going to go estimate here just because we've picked two wide receivers already. But I, I was I was very close to means because, again, that coaching connection is there. The high-end tools are there. But I think estimate is a pretty good value at this point because he's got good vision between the tackles. He's got good contact balance, really good forward-pressing physicality, and there is some upside in the passing phase as well. Would you? Uh, quick question. Would you have still sided with me if the pick was Dylan Lauby? Because that's who I wanted, but he went one pick ahead of me. I it, it wouldn't have been. I would have. I would have. It would have been even more effusive on the running back side. I love Lobby, man. He's he's a very very. I'm a big fan of what he has to offer. I think that receiving upside is one of the best receiving backs in the class. And then he's a really dense, compact back with great explosion too. And I like how he. I like how he um uses his explosiveness to kind of. You know, kind of like a receiver of stems, he will set up blockers and open space with that. And I like that too. So I think he's actually pretty underrated. I would take him, I would take him pretty quickly. Yeah, as someone from New Hampshire, I have a huge bias for the guy who played at UNH. So every time I do a Patriots mock draft, I try and get him. Uh, but I didn't come up with him this time. So I'm so curious if he's even still someone they would consider just because he's not obviously the same as Antonio Gibson. But when you think of the role. They're probably going to be doing the same thing. I'm with you. I love Lauby. Uh, like Danny Woodhead was the first guy I liked as a Patriots fan. And he obviously, for obvious reasons, the comp is there. But I think it's legitimate because <laughs> they got like the skill sets are pretty similar. But yeah, if, if it was Lauby, I would have, I would have forced the pick to be him. I'm a big fan. And means, means is just kind of tough for me to see where he's going to go. Like conservatively, mm -hmm. I usually go fifth. Like, oh, if somebody really likes him, I feel like the Patriots, because of the Underwood connection, are going to be really in on him. Uh, but I agree. If you could get him in like the sixth, I think that's a much better value. All right, Dak, who do you got next on your list? Ah, we finally getting some corner help. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I, I doubled it to corner here. And again, I, I mean, regardless of uh, who's head coach, um, you know, I don't think people should sleep on the possibility of, you know, late round cornerback for the Patriots earning a role. Uh, I'm a big believer in Mike Pellegrino as a cornerbacks coach, just in general, uh, the defense under the leadership of Gerard Mayo. I mean, the Patriots, if there's one thing they've been really good at, not, not just over the last few years, but for a long time, uh, it's, it's taking corners late in the draft or undrafted, plugging them in uh, almost right away. Um, so I think there's a chance that they, they do that in this draft. Um, but for me, I made two round six picks, both corners. The first was Jarvis Brownlee out of Louisville at number 180. And then at 194, uh, I swung a trade with the Bengals where I gave them pick number 193 and 231. Uh, and they gave me pick number 194 and 224. So I moved back one spot and then in the seventh round moved up seven spot uh, spots. I'll be honest. I just did it because I felt like doing a trade. <laughs> um, I said, why not? But either way, at 194, I then took DeAndre Prince, cornerback out of Old Miss. 
Um, it's got the height at six at six foot. Again, I'm with you, Taylor. I think they need to find someone who can play on the outside. Uh, they got a lot of guys who, you know, whether it be because of their size or just, you know, where I think they're best, like Jonathan Jones, he can play outside corner. I think he's shown that, but I think he's best in the slot. And then Marcus Jones, clearly more of a slot cornerback. Even I don't even know how good he is because I thought he struggled last year in training camp and early in the season before he suffered that injury. And then again, a lot of other guys who are either inexperienced or coming off of injuries. Um, so again, I'm just taking as many guys as I can at that spot. Um, and I'm just trying to target size. And I feel like Prince fills that hole. Uh, but regardless, I, I wanted to get at least a couple corners in this draft and I got him in round six. So we both double dipped. I went with tight ends. One, these have just been my late round biggies again, because I haven't watched a ton of the defensive guys, which is where I feel like they're probably going to hit. Um, so yeah, I think you're honestly on the right track, but the value with the tight ends, I feel like is really underrated. This is talked about as not a great tight end class, which I understand because like, even if you want to put Theo Johnson in that like day two conversation, which I think is valid, it's really Brock, Jatavian Sanders, and Theo Johnson is the guys who kind of headline this class. But I think there's a lot of guys who have more potential than they were able to show in college, and that's where these two guys are. So 180, I went with A.J. Barner. Really, the biggest swaying point for me was the Michigan State game. It was like him and J.J. McCarthy where I was like, oh, I can see why people like these guys. Like with McCarthy, was he was doing everything that you want to see from him with like the play extension, the downfield velocity and accuracy. But Barter was on the receiving end of a lot of those really impressive throws. You saw him be able to adjust to scrambles, make some catches in traffic. You saw him adjust, make catches outside of his frame. But he was mostly a blocking tight end for them, and he wasn't their main tight end, period. So I was really impressed with the profile. Then I did more research, and I was like, oh, this is not even like one of their featured guys. So – he really impressed me, and the fact that he can come in and be a blocker, play in line, but also give you some versatility, I really like that for a Patriots team that doesn't really have any exceptional blockers right now. Hunter Henry and Austin Hooper can play in line. I don't think that's where they're best. We saw last year, Dakota, where mostly Farrell Brown was the Y for them, and it was Hunter Henry who was really the guy who was off the line of scrimmage more. And then the second tight end I went with was Tip Raymond out of Illinois. I freaking love this guy. I think that for a 270-pounder, like he tested through the roof, and while I don't think – I mean, he also didn't have a lot of opportunity to show what he was as a receiver. Um, but one, I love his toughness after contact. Um, he really fights hard for extra yards, which like him and Ben Sinnott are two guys where I really love that about them, where it's like – I know Sinnott, there was one that's kind of off topic. There was one where like he was on the ground and hopped over a guy to get more yards, and I'm like, that's the kind of mentality I like. And Raymond does the same thing. If it's just two yards, he's going to try his best to get him. I think he's going to be a good red zone threat as well. Um, I like what I saw from him in flashes there. I think he's a smooth pass catcher. Again, I don't think he plays to that crazy athleticism in the receiving game, although I think he's got just enough vertical bursts to threaten the seams. Uh, but again, love to see what he can do in an expanded role. But his thing is blocking. Like, that's where if you're mad that the Patriots didn't re-sign Farrell Brown, you can get a much better value with Tip Raymond. He's got the mentality. I think technically he's one of the better blockers in this class where – a lot of the other guys have the like the effort and the mentality, which is what you want to start with for tight ends. It's like, yeah, we can coach up the technique. I just want to know that you're actually willing and capable. Uh, but he's already got a lot of that down. He can be improved, obviously, but that was what really swayed me on him. Love the size, the mentality. He's a guy we're on early downs. He can be your why. Gives you a ton of flexibility, and we know that Alex Van Pelt loves his multiple tight end sets. So that's my sell. What do you think, Ian? <laughs> I'm gonna split half and half here. I okay. think uh, I I like both picks with both guys. I think at the corner spot, Jarvis Brownlee Jr. I love his ability to play the boundary and the slot. I think he measured in like five eleven with thirty around 31, 32 inch arms. So really good proportional length combo. Explosive, really feisty, tenacious. Again, can be a little uncontrolled sometimes with that. But I do think you're getting the mentality you want and the physical profile you want too. So I'm a big fan of him as that late round gem. Uh, and then DeAndre Prince. I think I want to ask you guys a quick question. It regards to the scheme, is it more cover three middle field close or cover two middle field open? It's so I think the primary they switch it up a lot more in the past. Yeah. Couple I think they're starting to embrace a little more of the quarters and split safety. Really, their bread and butter is cover one. And then what they'll do a lot is disguise Tampa two with it. So it'll look like okay. cover one and then they'll split and then everybody uh, drops back. But it is definitely more buried cover scheme. But mostly three, one and two are like their main uh, main techniques. All right, cool. Because DeAndre Prince for me 
right now, very natural in side saddle and cover three looks. I think middle field closed. In man coverage, I do think there's room for him to improve this technique. So I'm not sure if he has the variability that you want on day one, but he's very explosive, very good at run support too. So I would just as soon take him. I'm going to take Brownlee because he's got that actionable slot boundary versatility on day one, that feisty mentality. And then with the tight end choice, it's a little tough, man, because A.J. Barner is one of the better blockers in the class. Tip Raymond is probably the best blocking tight end in the class. He has the want to, he has the mentality, but he has the explosiveness and the power and then the leg drive too. You know, a lot of guys try and block with their arms, right? They, they'll lurch beyond their center of gravity. They'll kind of negate their base. But Tip Raymond, man, he makes contact. He drives through like a snow plow every time. And he's really good at realigning his hips to kind of finish his assignments and plow guys out of their gaps. Really love that part of his game. One of the best, probably the best blocking tight end in the class. And then as a receiver, I think Barner is a little more fluid on his breaks. I think he's definitely more variable with his route tree. Tip Raymond is pretty stiff in his hips. He kind of reminds me of Charlie Kolar just in that sense mm -hmm. where Kolar really surprised a lot of people with how well he tested because you look at the film and you see a tall route runner who doesn't sink his hips very well, doesn't divert direction very well. But Tip Raymond does have, I think, you know, he's going to be very limited with his route tree. That's the tough part. But if you get him the ball on swings, on, you know, just quick sit routes where, you know, he just uses his body to outmuscle DBs, he's got pretty good hands, better than I expected. I think he can use diamond techniques, secure the ball, pretty good red zone translatability there. And then the toughness after the catch, too, is very appealing. So as much as I like tight ends who can separate independently and i think barner translates a little bit better there with tip raymond you're getting a day one impact guy as a blocker you're getting really strong hands in the red zone you're getting that physical rack ability we're gonna go with tip raymond we're gonna go with tip and then jarvis brownlee for this round you made a good point the explosiveness that he tested with it definitely shows up in his blocking more so you're like oh this dude's different like i haven't yeah. watched anybody who's really yeah. like him and then you said as a route runner i'm like i want to see it i wasn't sure if it was just limited opportunities or maybe get coached up but i agree it's a little little stiff there all right, last pick, Dak. And I like this one, too. I feel like we're going to have another tough choice. Let the people know who you got. Yeah, uh, moving up seven spots from 231 uh, to 224. Just wanted to take a lottery ticket with an offensive tackle, Frank Crum, out of Wyoming. Uh, I mean, on our website anyway, he's listed as six foot eight, three thirteen. So this guy's obviously huge. He's very tall. Um, and I'm just looking for a guy, again, in the late rounds to draft him. Kind of like what the Patriots did with Andrew Stuber a couple of years ago, who hasn't shown anything. Um, maybe maybe have more luck this time around. Uh, just, you know, that size is interesting. Get him in, coach him up, see what happens. Uh, so Frank Crum for me was the pick. Yeah, he's a guy that I keep, like, in my comments. I usually get, like, Javon Foster day three. And people are like, what about Crum? I haven't watched him, but he's clearly someone that the fan base is excited about. So, Ian, I'm very excited to hear what you think about him. I went with, I agree they do need more running back depth. You know, Kevin Harris, I think he's solid, but he doesn't really move the needle. And I thought it was kind he of what he is. Yeah, and I thought it was alarming he didn't get more opportunities once Ramondre got hurt and really nobody um, on their depth chart did, even though they had a uh, few bodies there. So I went with Dylan Johnson out of Washington. Uh, I might This might have been wishful thinking that he's going to be available this late. But at the same time, this is, I haven't, again, I haven't studied the running backs very closely, but obviously watched a decent amount of Washington games considering how much success they had. And one thing, I just like guys that make the position look easy. And Dylan Johnson is just such a smooth runner. I like this vision. I just He seems really efficient. Um, I feel like especially with what the Patriots have right now where you have Ramondre as the bell cow, you got Antonio Gibson as your third down change of pace. I think Dylan Johnson can come in and be kind of a change of pace, but also more of like a short yardage specialist, kind of like what we expected with uh, Zeke Elliott last year. So not going to go like, Two into the weeds here because, again, I'm not going to pretend like I watch a ton of him. But from what I saw, I was like, I like this guy. He also wears the hood. I love players that wear the hoodies. I think that is an absolutely fantastic aesthetic. So that may have swayed me a bit as well. Uh, but I feel like Johnson really would fit pretty well uh, with Patriots having the backfield right now. Yeah, just with the drip score, I could see that for sure. You know, you love the drip. Uh, I Dylan Johnson is a player I like because I picked estimate earlier on. I'll probably go with the tackle here just to diversify the positions. But Dylan Johnson, I think, you know, he didn't test as well as people expected, right? Four, six, eight, 40 yard dash, which again, I mentioned earlier, long speed is probably one of the last things I look for for running back. As long as you got the burst and the agility and the, and the vision, and the footwork, like you said, and I think he is really agile and fluid despite not having that elite vertical speed he's really good at varying his tempo right i do think there 
it's a little inconsistent behind the line, but I do think you're getting a guy who's agile for his size, fluid for his size, and knows how to kind of be patient and wait for the right hole and go through. Um, not a ton of receiving, proven receiving utility, but I do think a guy who can enter your rotation and provide value. Frank Crum is one. I'll be honest, I do need to watch a little bit more of him. I remember back in 2023, uh, the 2023 cycle, he was also kind of, uh, you mentioned, you saw him mentioned occasionally as a late round, potential late round guy. You watch the tape and, you know, six foot eight definitely plays like it, right? It's not like Joe Alt who plays so naturally to leverage, right? Frank Crum does play a little bit taller. He's a little bit high hip. So you want to kind of iron out that leverage acquisition. And again, I need to refresh on this 2024 stuff, his 2023 tape as well, but um, very athletic. 494, 40 yard dash. I think it's 733 seven, three cone, which is just insane for a guy with his size. So I think he's going to be 25 years old as a rookie. So a little bit older. You're kind of. You're worried that you might be setting your ways with the bad habits that'll show up on, on film. But late round, round seven, get a flyer in there, tools rich tackle, one of the better flyers that you can add. I think at, at the, you know, at, at worst, he's good rotational depth. Maybe he becomes a swing tackle for you. And at best, maybe you get some really nice return on investment. So I'm gonna go with Crumb, but um for those positions, Kamani Vidal. From Troy is another late round running back that I like a lot. I think if you get him in this in this range, you're you're really uh, doing a nice uh, doing a, I, I'm blanking on the word for a second. You're really getting a good a good value acquisition. And then uh, offensive tackle, a couple names that come to mind for me: Tylen Grable from UCF, really lean athlete, really good length, leverage acquisition again, some really nice power drive on tape. And then one guy that's kind of a sleeper, Mike Edwards from Campbell. The dude is massive. He's like 6'6", over 330, I think. But he moves pretty well on tape, too. So a guy who might have some left-right versatility. Uh, late, later in the draft, there's a lot of, you know, I think people kind of sleep on the depth of this class. I think there's a lot of guys who could be solid value there. How do you feel about Travis Glover? He is like my day three guy. I love Georgia him. State. Yes, sir, man. He's uh, he's fun. He's fun. I remember he was a late addition to the Senior Bowl roster. I got to watch a little bit of him during the season. Has the tools, man. He's got the height, the length, the mass for sure. The power drive as well. Not elite hip flexibility, but I think he has enough explosion off the line to just kind of generate power from that length and that mass. And then he has some pretty nice flashes of you know pass protection as well. I think enough knee bend to uh, attain leverage and maintain synergy uh, again you're working with some some developmental upside there but i do i do like the tools a lot in the later rounds if they double dip a tackle if it's javon foster or travis glover like those are my guys i'm like please please just do me this one solid i need one of these guys they're nasty i feel like they're athletic i love their tools at the very least i think they could be really fun swing tackles all right let's look at the board so first we have drake may Second round, Xavier Worthy. Third round, Roger Rosengarten. Then we got DJ James, a corner. Then we've got Malik Washington, Audric Estime, Jarvis Brownlee, Tip Raymond, and Frank Crum. That's not bad. I think we have a good diversity, a skilled talent, positional talent. What do you think, Ian? How do we do overall? I would give this one... A minus B plus. I think you know the one thing. The one thing is that maybe more size at receiver, right? Because again, you got Demario Douglas. Like I, ideally, I would have liked it, but hey, I was the one who ultimately swayed it to to worthy. So I was kind of punting on that. So you know, I, admittedly, right? You would have liked to check that box, but at the same time, I think what Worthy and Washington can do and how they can play off of each other it, is very exciting, right? And you get Drake May in that offense. Love how he fits the Van Pelt speed scheme. Rosengarten gives you a developmental tackle who I think can play pretty early in his career as long as he works on that play strength he has a lot of the bedrock traits that you want tip raymond is a great third tight end to have elite run blocker already so you know you have the two-phase impact uh and then you got dj james jarvis brownlee again really physical really feisty press man corners who have that physicality brownlee can play the slot as well uh playmaking ability in james's corner and then you get Crum as a developmental tackle. Estime is a really good volume back. If you want him to, if you have the lead, he can help you keep the lead. Uh, so, yeah, I think you checked a lot of the boxes in this draft. I think there were a few tough choices in there, but we got through it. And I think we covered a lot of the bases for the Patriots. Yeah, the the, the one, and it's not a regret, but uh, the one other need I was trying to find a way to address uh, is safety. And I, I don't know if you agree with this, Taylor, but I also think free safety is a sneaky big need for them. I, I thought it was a weak spot last year. Um, I don't really like Kyle Duggar in that spot. Um, it remains to be seen exactly what they're going to do with Marte Maple. But regardless, um, I, I think it would be a good idea for them to find a, a true uh, free safety of the future. Um, I just wasn't able to get it done in this mock draft. But what do you think? 
I agree. My mock draft I just did on CLNS, I actually took Cameron Kitchens. Um, I think it was in the third, third or fourth round. Uh, I love the ball skills. I love the range he's got, the physicality, like as a tackler. I like a safety who's really like he can just hit guys and they stop on contact. That's really exciting for me. Um, I feel like he can get himself in trouble, but with so many of these younger safeties, like that kind of just comes with the territory. You got to coach him up and get the technique more sound. But I agree. I feel like best case scenario is maybe Marte takes over as the free safety. Now that he's got more experience under his belt, feels more comfortable. And then you can get Jabril Peppers down into the box where I feel like he belongs. And then we also know that Kyle Duggar is happy with the transition tag. So if he ends up getting traded – Whatever pick he ends up acquiring, I feel like that's going to end up going uh, to a safety at some point because they definitely will need it as many three-plus safety packages as they like to use. But, uh, Dad, I think we fixed the team. Well done, buddy. I know. we. Uh, <laughs> I think more than anything, we did a draft that makes sense. Like, I don't yeah. think there would be any uh, – if the Patriots did this kind of draft, I don't think there would be any fans, you know, with pitchforks. Now, there's no <laughs> reaching for a, a guard center – <laughs> at, at 21 overall or whatever Cole Strange was, uh, or any weird goofy Bill Belichick picks uh, working <laughs> here. I think everything we did makes sense, at least on paper. So I, I think we did well. We avoided a Jordan Richards scenario. Good yes, for us. Yes, better, better example. <laughs> we no Jordan Richards. Yeah. All right. This was a lot of fun, fellas. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Please, again, got to go off medical order. I'll start with you, Dak, then you, Ian. Please let the people know where they can find you and what excellent stuff I know you got yeah, uh, you can find me on X at Dak Randall, as always. And um, again, you know, my main focus here uh, for Pro Football Network over the next month or so is draft prep, not just Patriots, uh, but really just sort of league wide. That's what I'm focusing on more so these days is all around the uh, all around the league, and especially with the help of of the stuff that Ian Cummings and the other guys in the scouting department do. Um, so a lot of drafts up coming up, and, and looking forward to it. You can find me at IC underscore draft. Any questions you have draft related, feel free to hit me up. I try to be responsive uh, as soon as I can. We got more report updates, report rights before I finalize my big board on April 15th. So that's kind of the main focus here. But we'll also be updating the MDS uh, with with uh, more reports and exciting fixes for the uh, multi-user framework as well. So a lot coming down the pipeline. It's going to be fun. We got one more month, less than a month to go now. Uh, so we're on the home stretch. It's going to be a fun time. So, so close. Keep up the great work, fellas. Again, appreciate you. As always, appreciate you all for watching. Now, take care of yourselves. Take care.